This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. And we're already seeing concerns emerging about uh, the shrinking of civic space um, and reports of political interference uh, in the National Human Rights Institution in the lead-up to the election. That was UN Human Rights Spokeswoman Ravina Shamdasina on the closing of its uh, office, Uganda's office uh, in Uganda. Details coming up. Also, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called out Russia for the effect its invasion of Ukraine is having on global hunger. And a team from ECOWAS left Niger without meeting the leader of the new military junta. These stories and more on African News Tonight. Our top story, the UN Human Rights Office said today it has been forced to close its office in Uganda and would officially cease operations in the country tomorrow. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. UN Human Rights Spokeswoman Ravina Shamdasani tells VOA the government informed her office in February of the decision not to renew the host country agreement that allows the agency to work in the country. In their view, uh, Uganda was at a stage in its um, uh, ability to manage the human rights situation where the UN Human Rights Office was no longer needed. Uh, We, of course, deeply regret this decision. Um, We've been in the country for 18 years. Uh, We've threatened um, and we've tried to serve as a bridge between the government um, and civil society. Shandasani acknowledges Uganda has made progress on several human rights issues. For example, she notes notes that Uganda is the second country in Africa to adopt a national action plan on business and human rights. However, she adds many challenges and problems remain. She says human rights officials are particularly concerned about the situation ahead of the 2026 elections. And we're already seeing concerns emerging about uh, the shrinking of civic space um, and reports of political interference uh, in the National Human Rights Institution in the lead-up to the elections. We are worried. We're worried that there's an increasingly hostile environment uh, for civil society actors, journalists, uh, human rights defenders. She warns the prevailing bellicose climate in Uganda is not conducive to free and fair elections. Shamdasani says the recent passage of Uganda's anti-homosexuality bill, which makes homosexual acts punishable by death, is of great concern. It's deeply discriminatory, um, and it's had already a corrosive effect on all of society. It's encouraging people to um, almost carry out witch hunts um, of lesbians and gays uh, in Uganda. Um, I mean, this is an example of a law which uh, is in clear violation of Uganda's international human rights commitments. Shamdasani says the UN Human Rights Office remains committed to working on human rights in Uganda. While UN officials no longer will be on the ground, she says they will continue to monitor the situation, but from a distance. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called out Russia at a meeting of the U.N. Security Council for the effect its invasion of Ukraine is having on global hunger. VOA senior diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sane reports. Russia has been targeting ports and storage facilities vital for shipping grain from Ukraine. The strikes come after Moscow pulled out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative last month, an agreement that allowed Kyiv to export grain to global markets during the Russian invasion. On Thursday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken chaired a meeting at the United Nations Security Council focused on food insecurity and called out Moscow as Ukrainian trucks can no longer load their grains onto ships. Every member of this council every member of the United Nations should tell Moscow enough. Enough using the Black Sea as blackmail. Enough treating the world's most vulnerable people as leverage. Enough of this unjustified, unconscionable war. 
International Rescue Committee President David Miliband told the Council there is consensus that conflict is the primary driver of food insecurity today, worsened by the climate crisis. We also know the countries. Every single assessment has the same list. Somalia, Afghanistan, Yemen, Nigeria, South Sudan, Sudan, Burkina Faso, Mali, Haiti. The analysis is not in dispute, but analysis is too often followed by paralysis. Blinken noted that five years ago, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution saying that the intentional starvation of civilians may constitute a war crime. Nearly 90 countries, including the United States, have already signed a new joint communique that we drafted and circulated, committing to end the use of famine, starvation, and food as weapons of war. Hunger must not be weaponized. I urge all member states to join this communique. Russian President Vladimir Putin hosted leaders of African countries late last month for a summit as the continent braced for the consequences of Moscow's withdrawal from the Ukraine grain export deal. Moscow tried to reassure its African partners, saying it understood their concern and was ready to export grain for free to African countries that need it. At the United Nations, relief experts discuss the global food supply, saying it is not a question of there not being enough food to feed everyone. It is a question of people in many countries not having enough food to survive because it is being blocked by unnecessary conflict. Cindy Sane, VOA News. Japan's foreign minister following a one-on-one meeting Thursday with Ethiopia's deputy prime minister expressed hope their two nations will work together on the resumption of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Maya Masakir reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi, making his first visit to Ethiopia on Thursday, expressed hope that the two countries can work together for a resumption of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. The foreign minister said he shared concerns about the impact of Russia's aggression against Ukraine on food security in Africa following a one-on-one meeting with Ethiopian Deputy Prime Minister Demek Amakonin. Japan deplores the termination of the Black Sea Grain Initiative by Russia and Japan hopes to work together with Ethiopia towards the resumption of the initiative. Since the start of the Black Sea Grain deal, which took effect in July 2022, the United Nations has overseen the export of more than 262 metric tons of wheat to Ethiopia. Climate shocks that brought about severe droughts and conflict in Ethiopia have put over 20 million people in need of food assistance. Hayashi also talked about the Japanese government's support of the peace deal that brought an end to the war in Ethiopia's Tigray region. I mentioned Japan's support for the implementation of the peace agreement signed uh, between the Ethiopian government and the TPLF and stated Japan would give serious consideration to further cooperation towards the implementation of this agreement. Demeka, who also serves as Ethiopia's foreign minister, said the two had a productive discussion on issues of mutual interest. In our talks, we, we pledged to deepen our partnership in the political, economic, and social sectors. In particular, we renewed our commitment to strengthen our investment, trade, and development cooperation. The Japanese foreign minister's visit to Southwest Asia and Africa concluded Thursday in Ethiopia after earlier stops in South Africa and Uganda. Maya Misaker for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Despite a reputation of political neutrality and professionalism, the Tunisian army followed President Kais Saeed's orders to close parliament and sack the government two years ago. A new book based on interviews with retired officers reveals how and why the army played a crucial role in the president's power grab. Reporter Noura Hafaid, as narrated by VOA's Mohamed El Shenawi, examines the findings from Tunis. The Tunisian revolution erupted in 2011 
with a campaign of civil resistance and street demonstrations that led to the ousting of longtime President Zain al Abidin bin Ali. During the uprising, the Tunisian army chose not to fire on protesters. It then defended the transition to democracy by ignoring calls for a military coup in 2013. However, in his new book, Soldiers of Democracy, Brookings Center for Middle East Policy fellow Sharan Griwal says the army played a crucial role in Tunisian President Qais Saeed's moves to take We have technical difficulties. We shall resume. Well, I mean, we'll have the report as soon as it's possible. Um, a team of uh, the West Africa Regional Bloc ECOWAS left Niger without meeting the leader of the junta, which seized power in a coup. General Abdurrahman Tiani or the post president Mohamed Bazoum. For further clarification on the ongoing matter in Niger, I talked to VOA French to Africa Chief Timothy Donangmai. In fact, according to some sources in Niamey, they didn't even leave the premises of the Niamey airport. Uh, apparently, the new leader said they wanted to protect them from people who support the coup. Which, which is a very uh, specious uh, explanation. Uh, so they were not able to meet the coup leaders or to to discuss um, the, the situation there so so this thing is 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 falling apart here you know uh, ECOWAS, uh, a regional body comprised of 15 West African countries, they couldn't get through to these coup cool leaders. The African Union, the United Nations have also issued statements condemning the apparent coup. Uh, what do you think is going to happen now? It is hard to tell, and, and the latest uh, news is that the junta in uh, Niamey uh, revoked military and security uh, cooperation agreements with France, which has about 1,500 soldiers in Niger fighting terror groups there. And the French government said that it's not up to um, the, the Putin's regime to, to revoke those agreements, but only a legitimate government can do that. So, so much uncertainty on the a situation in, in Niger now, and um, it's hard to tell how this is going to end. And Timothy, uh, Guinea, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali especially, which shares borders with Niger, they all have released a joint statement denouncing the ECOWAS sanctions as illegal, illegitimate, and inhumane, and refusing to apply them. And they also said any military intervention against Niger will be considered as a declaration of war against Burkina Faso and Mali. So where did this united front come from? Is this this disdain they have, all of them, for France? Yeah, th this uh, unexpected element is complicating the equation now in, in Niger. And I think all of those countries that you named, all of the regimes there, uh, military regimes, they went through uh, ECOWAS sanctions, uh, UN, AU statements against schools. So uh, they were kind of isolated, and now they have company. Uh, there are now four countries that are led by uh, Puchist uh, hunters. So, you know, they, they decided to band together and uh, uh, to, to, to form a front uh, against ECOWAS, against France, and uh, as we discussed yesterday, anytime you're against France in Francophone Africa, people applaud you, at least the street applauds you. And Timothy, lastly, let me ask you, these uh, coup d'etats uh, overthrowing uh, uh, a person like Bazoum uh, in Burkina Faso, in Mali. So now, should we like conclude that these coup d'etats are not actually to overthrow the, the leader of that country, but to actually overthrow France? Uh, yes, uh, I think at the bottom of all this, the, the internal issues, the coup leaders try to peg it on, uh, on France. You know, it's a convenient explanation for their action. But in the case of Niger, it was said that uh, President Bazoum was in the process of uh, firing the head of uh, his presidential guard. And so that guy, he would have lost his, uh, his job. And so the only way to keep his job was to go through a coup. That was VOA French to Africa chief uh, Timothy Donangmai.
And now uh, we go back to VOA's Mohamed El Shenawi's report on Tunisia and its military. The Tunisian revolution erupted in 2011 with a campaign of civil resistance and street demonstrations that led to the ousting of longtime President Zain al Abidin Ben Ali. During the uprising, the Tunisian army chose not to fire on protesters. It then defended the transition to democracy by ignoring calls for a military coup in 2013. However, in his new book, Soldiers of Democracy, Brookings Center for Middle East Policy fellow Sharan Griwal says the army played a crucial role in Tunisian President Qais Saeed's moves to take full control of the government. He says the army facilitated Saeed's moves to close the parliament, try dissidents in military courts, and expel sub-Saharan African migrants into the desert near the border. During a recent Brookings Institute webinar, Greywell explained why the military followed Saeed's orders. The culture of being subordinate to the president led them to defer to his interpretation that this was legal and constitutional. And the desire to stay far from politics led them to think that obeying these orders would be less political than openly refusing the order. The author says that professionalism means obeying all orders except if they are illegal or unconstitutional. He says two other factors shaped the army's behavior. Many of the military officers had come to embrace Qais Syed's populism and this desire to clean up the political system. And you've seen the top generals also have personal interests in sticking with Qais Syed. He has promoted these top generals ahead of schedule, promoted them to higher ranks, securing their support. Gruel says... Said also secured army support by appointing two military doctors as ministers of health and appointed a general as a minister of agriculture. VOA requested a response from the defense ministry but received no reply. A retired army officer agreed to comment on condition that his name would not be revealed. He said that all should remember that on July 25, 2021, Tunisians took to the streets, calling for the resignation of the government as the country was in turmoil, the economy was nosediving, and politicians came to blows in the parliament. He said Saeed responded that night by dismissing his cabinet and suspending the parliament for 30 days, which the constitution allows. Ayaj Rad, a research fellow at NATO Defense College, found through her research that there is no cohesive position in the Tunisian army about what happened in July 2021, which some Tunisians call a presidential coup. 